Great. Good morning, everyone. Uh, fantastic to be here in um, Abu Dhabi now the, the unusual storm uh, has subsided. Uh, so thank you all of you for, for making it. I know some of you came in the uh, day before yesterday, some of you came in yesterday, some of you came in very late last night. Um, um, my name is Ben Backwell. I'm the CEO of the Global Wind Energy Council. As you know, we are one of the largest uh, renewable energy technologies, um, one of the most important transition technologies um, in the net zero scenarios. We, along with solar, will account for um, um, the, 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 the biggest share of um, energy um, and electric power um, in, in 2050, um, and we're going through a very rapid period of expansion. Um, we're going to um, make a few opening remarks um, before we present um, our data and policy experts, and then there'll be a panel discussion with um, some of the companies in the global wind um, industry. Um, but I first of all want to um, invite um, uh, first uh, Lars Meckenstock, who's the uh, Senior Vice President Commercial Offshore Wind for Mazda, very graciously uh, hosting us today in this uh, fantastic pavilion. So Lars, if you could come up uh, to the stage, please, that'd be great. And then I'd also like to um, introduce uh, Giris Tanti, who is the Vice Chair of uh, Suzlon, uh, leading Indian uh, wind turbine manufacturer, Girish. Great to see you again. And, uh, yeah. Thank you. Um, so, uh, before I hand over to um, Lars and Girish, I'm just going to make a few uh, remarks about the Global Wind Report um, and about what we're seeing in the market. Um, I think the first thing to point out is that the wind industry has been one of continual growth. Uh, for about 30 years, uh, so our growth curve is one of you know, very steep uh, growth um, over about three decades. Uh, we started as uh, almost a, as a kind of hobby industry 40 years ago with people building wind turbines in their back gardens uh, in places like Denmark and the US and the UK and then um, started uh, building in China and in you know, Africa and Brazil and many places around the world. We're now a truly global um, industry. We play a central part in the climate and energy scenarios of all the main international organizations. Um, and we're on a growth trajectory, um, I can announce now, of breaking the record for wind energy of annual installations um, in 2023 of 117 gigawatts. So that's the largest amount of wind energy ever installed in a single year um, and quite significantly higher than the previous record. So it's a, it's a new record and that's something really to celebrate. Uh, for all of us, I think. Um, so, and, and we expect this growth curve, as, as, um, as uh, uh, Joyce and Fong will explain, we expect this growth curve to accelerate in the coming years. So that's, that's the good news. Um, I guess the challenge is that the ambition that policymakers and society has for wind energy is far higher than that. Um, that's good news for us because it gives us uh, a pathway, it gives us an enormous challenge and an opportunity um, as, an, as an industry. Uh, but to give an idea, uh, within the net zero uh, scenario that the IEA has, we should be installing something like 320 gigawatts of uh, wind energy by the end of this decade. So that's 320 gigawatts per year um, of wind energy by the end of this decade. We're currently installing about 120. Um, according to IRENA's uh, tripling Scenario, it's even higher. I think it's about 380 uh, gigawatts by uh, the end of the decade. So, you know, on the one hand, we have this uh, incredible opportunity and expectation. On the other hand, we're not growing fast enough. In fact, none of the energy um, transition industries and sectors are growing fast enough. Um, but we're here to change that, right? Um, and um, we're working you know, very, very hard with governments, with stakeholders, with companies to see how we can get on an acceleration path. Uh, GREC was the founding partner um, of the Global Renewables Alliance uh, that we created uh, last year along with our colleagues in solar PV, in hydrogen, in storage and other technologies. Um, we played a very big part um, working with uh, the UAE and supportive governments, with companies like Mazda to get the tripling commitment included um, into climate and energy targets. 
Um, that successfully made its way into the COP declaration in Dubai, just up the road. Um, so it sets a new benchmark for us. Um, and we're now um, with the campaign this year, which is called Time for Action, looking at the pillars of how we can um, implement on a much faster level and create this um, opportunity um, um, which, will, which will take us to a, to, a, to a much higher level of production. Now, I just wanted to maybe talk about one or two uh, challenges uh, as I see them, and we'll go more into this. Um, the, the first one is supply chain is not sufficient at the moment, even for the kind of doubling trajectory that we're on at the moment. Um, and particularly in certain areas, um, the US and Europe, um, we'd say the supply chain, um, level in the supply chain is not um, happening at the level that it needs to. Um, so I think that's challenge uh, number one. And there's a number of reasons for this, the main one being market challenges. And I think the other main reason historically being the doubt in people's minds between whether on, on whether the policy ambitions of governments are actually going to be fulfilled. So I think there's always a doubt in companies' minds about whether um, the targets are actually going to be fulfilled and whether you know, barriers like planning are going to be removed in order to justify the investment. So we need to kind of close that gap that some people have talked about as being a, a say-do gap or a, a kind of implementation gap. So I think that's, that's uh, number one. Um, I think the um, second thing is to, is, is to remove the still very uh, large bureaucratic barriers that we face to wind energy. So planning times have gone up pretty much everywhere. You know, they've gone from being a few months 20 years ago to um, six or seven or eight or nine years now to permit an offshore wind farm, for instance. Uh, so planning barriers, as the industry's got bigger, planning barriers have grown rather than diminished. We need governments to do better, to be more efficient, to be more streamlined. We need social um, buy-in and we need stakeholder buy-in to be able to do that. It's a huge challenge. Um, and then I think just finally I'd like to say it's, it, you know, we're an international industry and we, we, the, the industry has been built upon um, cooperation um, from the very early days. Um, so you know, people from China going to DTU in Denmark, people from Denmark going to China and building the first wind farm up in China, um, people from Germany going to Brazil and building the first wind farms in, in Brazil. Um, and in South Africa and so on and so on, right? So it's a, it's a, it's a highly internationalized um, industry. Um, it's gonna need um, more international collaboration and cooperation in order to build out the enormous amount of supply chain uh, that we're gonna need over the next 30 years. So it's really important, I think, to um, uh, manage uh, competition in a, in, a, in, a, in a way that works, uh, that acknowledges the challenges and the difference um, and that strives towards fairness um, and level playing fields, but that maintains um, all this discussion within um, a, a collaborative framework, uh, within a multilateral framework. Um, you know, we're going to live with managed competition for a long, long time. It's a feature of uh, it's a feature of our society and of of, of capitalism that we're going to need uh, managed competition. So let's you know let's keep working together to try and uh, reduce uh, trade friction. Um, and keep working together. Um, I'll leave it there, and I'm gonna hand over to uh, Lars first, and then Gerich, um, and then we will dig into some of these issues once we've seen uh, the data. So again, thank you very, very much uh, for coming, and Lars, I'll hand it over to you. Yes, um, thanks a lot, Ben. And um, yeah, I have the pleasure to welcome you all at the Master Pavillon. Um, I learned this on short notice that I'm sitting, I have to apologize, our CEO want to sit here but there was something on, on short notice. Why, that's why I'm here, but I I'm, I'm, couldn't be more happy or happier to, to welcome you here. We're just a new member of, of GWEC and, and we're very proud to be part of this association. And uh, the timing is perfect. We had uh, a, lot of, um, a lot of tailwind from COP um, and last year when there were a lot of announcements in, in, in the wind uh, offshore energy world and must have been part of that. And um, yeah, thanks for being here, Ben. And, um, presenting this, um, this report. So it's fitting that we are back here in the UAE to launch this important uh, report and uh, under the UAE Consus, the world came together um, to agree on an ambitious and necessary commitment, the triple global renewable energy capacity by 2030. This is an, an impressive target. And we all know that this won't be easy, but um, I think our industry hasn't been 
better place ever to deliver on this promise and wind energy will play a very critical role in, in reaching these ambitions. So you might have seen that this, uh, in this report that 117 gigawatt of uh, new wind capacity added last year. Um, progress is being made and there's much to be proud of as an industry. And uh, we as master, we've seen this as first hand. So we, last year we finalized an 11 billion landmark uh, investment agreement with RWE to co-develop the three gigawatt um, Dogger Bank South wind farm in the UK. And we signed a 15 billion um, agreement and, and uh, partnership with Iberdrola to evaluate the joint development of, of wind offshore in the UK and other key markets like the USA and Germany. And uh, closer to the home here in, uh, in the UAE, we integrated the UAE wind program, bringing utility scale wind to the UAE for the first time. Um, these are all remarkable achievements and remarkable re uh, year for clean energy, especially wind. But um, as we will discuss later on, there are a lot of challenges uh, we are still facing and there's much to be done to make this uh, happen. Our investments must accelerate. The supply chain needs to be strengthened. Um, we all know that this was um, tough years uh, are behind us on, on that term. Um, trade barriers must be reduced. We need open trade. Uh, regulatory obstacles must be addressed to, to um, foster investments into uh, renewables and uh, the bottleneck of grid infrastructure needs to be expanded. So overall calibration is something that is key to increase so that industry scale up and, and um, events like this, associations like GWEC are a good place to, to foster those. So um, yes, we in the UAE we have proven that anything is possible when we come together. So thank you and looking forward to discussing with you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I would like to begin by uh, congratulating and appreciating GVAC for putting together this fantastic report, uh, designing it with uh, meticulous uh, detail, uh, you know, the global report for wind energy. It sets out a very constructive uh, role for wind energy in the, that it's expected to play in navigating the wind, you know, the energy transition for the world. I believe that I speak for the entire industry when I say that the extensive intelligence in this report offers truly brings together the sector and empowers the knowledge required for achieving the common goal. With the total global wind installation reaching 117 gigawatts, 2003 has been a historic year for all of us, almost 50% in excess of what we have done in the previous years. We continue to see strong recovery on the price volatility as well as supply chain disruptions post the pandemic and the Ukraine war. Likewise, there is more alignment amongst nations and the need to step up for the 3x renewable energy growth to combat climate change risk. But with the current rate of capacity addition, as indicated uh, by Ben, <coughs> you know, Arena's own projections state that 3.5 terawatt of wind installation is required by 2030. GVX's own forecast also states that, you know, with the current pace of the activities that we are doing, if everything remains the same, we will not hit more than 2 terawatts by 2030. So reaching the 3x uh, goal for us means an annual step up of almost 320 gigawatts uh, in the year. To stay course on this uh, 3x renewable energy journey, I think there needs to be a very strong collaboration between industries, policymakers, investors, and communities at large. I would like to make you know, two important points in this regards. I think the first uh, you know, it's very important that we move from goals and target setting, which we have done fantastically well until now, to come with robust implementation plan uh, from here on. You know, 
countries now need to develop very strong annual implementation plan uh, in a focused manner, working with uh, the various stakeholders to work out an annual growth up to 2030 to hit the targets. You know, problems related to project permits, technology adoption, manufacturing preparedness, supply chain development, grid and other infrastructure bottlenecks, all of these needs to be settled to accelerate the pace of meeting the ambitious target. And I believe that one of the most significant issues that the sector right now faces is a synchronized and alignment between multiple stakeholders to work on this common plan of execution. I think we must all work together to uphold the resilience in the flow, stock, and the value chain, which is in detail prescribed in the report also. This, this brings me to the second. This brings me to the second point for supporting the local localized supply chain while meeting the global goals. And this requires some serious efforts. I have always been of the opinion that every country has its own challenges, which cannot be resolved by external interventions and policy support. Country-specific blockages, especially those related to manufacturing ecosystems, economic environment, need to be resolved internally by those countries. The constantly changing business environment in many of the countries continues to disrupt the planning and investments in the local markets. Local financing, local policy support, alignment with the global vision, and the local business environment are crucial for development of sustainable local supply chain. However, localization always requires a balance. It must be clear that strengthening the local supply chain is a piece of a puzzle to meet the global goals to contributing the overall growth of the global supply chain. Countries required to make several tough choices. For example, what must be the share of local supply chain versus their global supply chain? These are all tough calls. Impact of pace with which we want to grow renewable energy in a specific country versus you know, build up of your local supply chain. And thirdly, you know, at what cost you want to build up your renewable energy in your country versus building a resilient local supply chain. So it's a combination of various tough calls that countries have to make. I think Arena has projected that the transition uh, opportunity that the world has would uh, throw up almost 40 million jobs uh, across the world. And 18 million of them are expected to come from renewable energy itself. Capitalizing on these opportunities would require a strong collaboration of innovation, technology, manufacturing capabilities, and people scale skill collaboration between North and South. Once again, I would like to remind my esteemed audience here today that we at Suzlon believe very strongly that renewables help equalize the world with innovation and equal growth and opportunities of economic opportunities to build a resilient supply chain while catering the interest of all lives. So let me, <coughs> let me may, uh, Let's make wise decisions and encourage others to make the same. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and we're, we're, we're very happy uh, now to have um, um, uh, uh, Mohammed Jamil Al Ramahi, sorry, the uh, CEO of Mazda, our host here, who's come to join us. Um, uh, Mohammed has been an incredible supporter of the. Um, tripling uh, renewables uh, pledge was at the launch actually in New York and helped us launch that um, and has, has played a very um, instrumental role at uh, COP28 as well in getting that. So Mohammed, would you like to say a few few words that you're here? Okay, I... just, just, just a few words, just a few words. I just want to say thank you, Ben. Thanks to your organization. Thanks for your support. Thanks to the wind industry. And thank you for being here at the World Future Energy Summit. And we are happy to be a member, of course, and a supporter. And of course, uh, there is a lot to do in our industry, especially wind. Uh, and I'm sure that the panelists will contribute to that discussion, a very important discussion, especially nowadays. So uh, I'm glad that uh, you've launched your report here in Abu Dhabi. 
uh, and uh, I'm happy to, uh, for Masdar to be part of the organization and to support what you guys are trying to do. So uh, uh, good luck and uh, all the best. Thank you, Ben. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Mohammed. Um, I'm going to now invite um, our experts to the panel just to talk through some of the um, highlights of the report. So first of all, um, Joyce Lee, who's our chief policy um, officer. Uh, Joyce, please come to the statement. And Joyce is the lead, the lead author of this report and of the last few reports. So thank you, Joyce. I'll, I'll sit here. And then um, uh, Feng Zhao, who's our head of uh, global market intelligence and strategy um, and is really the brains behind all the data and the, uh, 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 has, has probably got one of the best grips of what's going on in the global wind market um, in, at any one time. So Joyce um, and Fong, I'm going to hand over to you. Uh, thank you, Ben. Uh, Where's the slide? Uh, sorry, please bear with us. We just try to find out the slide. But before we start, I just want to say uh, thank you for everyone to join us for this uh, report launch. Uh, normally, as you know, we launch the report at the end of Q1 every year. But this year, we decided to present this uh, final report, uh, Global Wind Report 2024, at the master stage to feature the World Future Energy Summit. So yeah, just in uh, one minute or two, we are going to share the key findings from this report. All right. So while we're waiting, I just uh, um, try to kick off this conversation as Ben and also uh, Gersh already mentioned, and also last 2023, uh, it was the best year ever for the wind industry. Uh, in terms of new installation across the global, we have 11, 17, uh, 117 gigawatts of new capacity added into the uh, grid transmission, and that's a represent 50% of YOY growth. This brings the global cumulative installation across the milestone one terawatt. As you know, uh, last year in London, GWAC, together with the industry, we celebrate the uh, one terawatt party. Uh, looking at the onshore one uh, last year, um, in terms of great connection, we had more than uh, 100 gigawatt installed across global. That's also represent 54% of YOY growth. Uh, this milestone marked the first time the wind industry um, installed more than 100 gigawatt onshore wind into the power grid. And looking at offshore, uh, globally, we have nearly 11 gigawatt offshore wind capacity installed and connected to, to the power grid. Even though it's not the, the, the greatest year, but it still make 2023 uh, the second best year. Looking at the new installation per region, uh, last year we have APAC continue to need the global installation with 71% of the uh, new installation. Together with you know, Europe and North America, the three key markets made up 84% of the new installation, 84. But if we're looking at the installation per country, uh, the number is even more shock. One country, that's my home country, China, made up 65% of the global new installation with more than 75 gigawatt new onshore wind installed, connected to the power grid. If we're looking at the top 10 market last year, together with China, we have US, Brazil, Germany, India, the Netherlands, Sweden, France, Canada, the UK, 
the top 10 market alone made up 88% of the new installation. So you can see there is a huge growth, but there is the new capacity is not equally shared by region. Uh, what's the situation you know, uh, in the near term? We still believe that looking at the growth in the next five years, uh, we are going to have the five pillar growth region to, to support the growth momentum. We have Europe. Finally, we see 2023, the government in this continent start turning the ambitious target into the actions. In the US, we have the IRA, which is going to increase both the installation in the next five years, start from last year till 2032. Uh, At the same time, the IRA is going to create the supply chain, the jobs, and make sure the social benefit cross the East Coast, West Coast, etc. Also, China, no doubt about that, the Chinese market are going to continue to drive the growth in the next five years because the government has a 30, 60 pledge, and they are going to have the renewable to be more than 80% of the energy consumption by 2060. And also offshore wind, as last mentioned, uh, it was a turbulence year last year, but still, we, we across the globe, we see the government and developer has continued the commitment to develop offshore wind. We believe floating wind plus power to X solution will further unlock the offshore wind potential. Last but at least, that's the emerging market. Even though we see for the next three, four years, you know, Asia, Europe, US will continue to drive the growth, but we believe that start from 2025, the new growth from Central, Southeast Asia to emerging market in MENA region, including UAE, including Saudi, North Africa, are going to generate the further growth of the market. So looking at the growth in the next five years in total, we believe that the Kaga will stay nearly you know, the double digit, that's 9% of growth rate for onshore, offshore, cross global in the next five years. That's equals 158 gigawatt installation per year. Thank you, Alex. That's the slide I'm talking about. So for the next five years, we're going to see the Kaga 9%. The average growth will be 159. So imagine we had 117 gigawatt last year. That's the best year ever for the industry. If you look at the pie chart, the, the bar chart over there, we believe that you know, moving forward each single year in the next five years, we are going to have the, a record. So for Anshu Wen, the average growth rate will be 7%. So on average, that's 130 gigawatt. For offshore wind, the growth rate is even higher, double digit. That's 28% growth, equal to the average annual growth rate of 27 gigawatt. So again, um, due to this uh, you know, improved political support across global after COP28, GWAC forecasts that the milestone of the second terawatt will likely pass by the end of 2029. That's one year ahead of the schedule. However, even this growth, that's not enough to support the Paris Agreement and will leave a sizable gaps in the wind capacity required by 2030 to stay on track for IEA, NEET 25 pathway. So that's the growth outlook. But how we're going to achieve the tripling target by 2030. I'm going to stop here, leave the stage to my colleague Joyce. She is going to share some recommendation. Over to you, Joyce. Great. Thank you so much, Feng. Uh, so my name is Joyce Lee. I'm head of policy at the Global Wind Energy Council and one of the uh, co-leading authors of this report alongside Feng. Um, as he mentioned, I'll be introducing a bit of the narrative of how the industry uh, looked in 2023 and what the outlook for industry growth will be for wind energy in the years ahead. And we're doing this with the time horizon, uh, which is quickly approaching now to 2030, because the theme of this year's report 
is wind energy's role in achieving the global goal of tripling renewable energy capacity by 2030, which I'll come back to in just a second. Um, as a high-level overview of, of what we tried to do in this report, I'm going to introduce a few things here. So one thing is we tried to focus the discussion about the next six or seven years to 2030 on four domains. So we look at the investment environment, we look at supply chains for wind energy, we look at grid and system infrastructure, and we also look at, crucially, uh, public support and social consensus around the broader energy transition. And we look at these four things not because they're the, the only ones that matter, but because GWEC, uh, as, as a trade association for the global industry, strongly believes that these domains are going to be critical when it comes to the decisions we make, uh, being able to support uh, a just, equitable, and orderly energy transition ahead. The other um, issues that we bring into this year's reports are around the current technological era, which are now starting to impact the decisions that we make. So we look at issues around AI, automation, and robotics in the wind supply chain, what that means for uh, labor force development and workforce dislocation, as well as workforce value add additions. We look at the innovation cycle in the supply chain and how this impacts cost recovery. We also look at um, technology and digitalization gaps between the global north and south, and what this means when it comes to uh, access to energy, as well as the ability to site projects and bring on large-scale renewable energy integration into power systems. And finally, for each section of the report, for each of these issues I've mentioned, we provide concrete recommendations focused on not just national policymakers, but also the industry itself, the investment community, and representatives of society, such as civil society organizations, as well as non-governmental organizations. And the common thread of all of these recommendations is really about more robust forms of collaboration, which is hopefully a theme that we can get into in the discussion ahead. So much has been said already about the outcomes of COP28, about the tripling goal or, or the UAE consensus. Um, and there's just two things I want to point out here. Um, one is that we, we've had two forms of this goal being reached, and one is in the global stock take outcome. Uh, the global stock take outcome, while itself is not a legally binding text, it is politically significant because uh, Article 14 of the Paris Agreement, which is a legally binding text, does prompt countries, parties to COP, to take their cue and indications from the outcome of the global stock take to inform their contributions to climate change, both in terms of their participation in international cooperation, as well as their nationally determined contributions, or NDCs. The other form of the tripling goal being achieved was, was based on a sideline pledge, a voluntary pledge, which in the end reached 132 national signatories. I think it was the largest sideline pledge that came out of COP last year. And what was distinctive about this pledge was it actually it got into the specificity of how to reach the tripling goal. It got into the enablers. Some of them are listed here. So um, critical uh, drivers like speeding up permitting, accelerating grid connections, unblocking grid connection queues, strengthening the general market conditions for financing and investment to flow through to renewable energy projects, and creating sustainable frameworks for the procurement of renewables. That said, Something that we like to point out um, in this report is we face a very steep road ahead. And as Mr. Tanti very rightly pointed out in his opening remarks, this road is lined with, with tough calls, tough questions facing the industry. Um, so this is one of our flagship graphics of the report. It's, it shows that we're sitting right in the belt of a, you know, the, a critical S-curve that will make the difference between business as usual and a 1.5C pathway. Um, here we are in, in, in 2023 with 117 gigawatts installed, and where we need to go by 2030 is at least the 320 gigawatts of annual installations. Um, that's uh, according to the IEA net zero pathway, as, as Ben uh, mentioned earlier, the IRENA uh, modeling puts us on an even steeper pathway. And what we're facing is competing pressures on growth. So you can see that there's headwinds and there's tailwinds. And this is not just about the industry. This is about the larger global macroeconomic and geopolitical environments that the industry operates in. Um, some of the, the significant uh, tailwinds have been named so far. So we've seen you know, coalescing political ambition for the transition in, a, in more concrete terms than ever before. 
We're seeing increased competitiveness of wind vis-a-vis -vis fossil fuels, and we're also seeing strengthening public support. At the same time, public support at asset level, or you could say at community level, is, is difficult. We're facing land rights issues, seabed allocation issues in uh, new emerging and mature markets for winds all around the world. Uh, emerging markets are facing rising cost of capital issues and uh, capital market risk perceptions, which you know, may not significantly shift in the next six years. So this, this story about how to ascend the S-curve for growth to get us as close as possible to that 2030 target for 1.5C is, is really at the heart of uh, this year's report. And I'll make two more points before we, we go into our panel discussion. So one thing we wanted to do was show the, the risk perceptions of the global industry operating in this complex, multi-dimensional environment. And it's, it's uh, you know, not a straightforward story. So uh, what we looked at was short-term risk and long-term risk. Um, in, in terms of the long-term growth, uh, the industry is actually becoming more optimistic than the last time we ran this survey a few years ago. So when they look at issues like uh, supply chain development, workforce development, social acceptance, um, ambition expressed in concrete targets for renewables, we see that long-term optimism is increasing. But the short-term challenges are very acute. Uh, things like grid connection, uh, uh, grid build-out, anticipatory investment in uh, system infrastructure, flexibility technologies, as well as um, issues like uh, workforce needs and supply chain management in the next five years. These are really seen as more acute by the industry today. And finally, I mentioned before that we go into concrete recommendations, which I won't uh, detail uh, on stage with you today. They are in the report, and we're very happy to chat about them afterwards. Um, just to say that, as, as we, we've mentioned, you know, the, the tough calls ahead. Um, we strongly believe that the decisions we make in the next six years are going to make the difference, um, not just between how close we can get to 1.5C pathway, but whether the wind industry can deliver on, on a just, equitable, and orderly transition. And these four areas, grids, supply chains, social support, and the, the investment and financing environment are going to make the difference for the industry. So let's uh, go into the panel discussion from here and, and hopefully we can dig into this a little bit more. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you very, very much, Joyce. <clears throat> I'll ask uh, Joyce and, and Fong just to step down for a bit and I'll invite our, uh, our um, further two panelists to the discussion. Um, Mr. Wu Kai, the chairman of Goldwind International, a long, long term participant in the wind industry. And then I'd like to um, ask Ms. Anna Beranek, who's the senior vice president for global head of corporate affairs for Siemens Gamesa. Anna, please. <clears throat> Now, I know, I know we're running a little bit um, over time, so I'm going to go straight into it. And I'm going to start off by asking the panelists just to reflect a little bit on the data. Where does, where does growth come from? And what are the markets that we should be excited about principally um, in the next period? Um, um, and and what are the, where, where are the kind of potential markets that will take us to an acceleration? And, and I'll ask um, Anna uh, first, if that's all right. Thanks so much for inviting me, Ben. I think um, as a Spanish, German, Danish wind turbine manufacturer, for me it's quite difficult <laughs> to single out one or two markets. Um, that being said, the message that applies to all of them is you know, this need, as you also mentioned before, to turn uh, targets into real projects and also some profitability for all of us. And that will allow um, OEMs to continue investing in new developments and new technology. And this is very important, as you also mentioned, Ben, because it's about, and also Joyce, it's about robust. Our market needs to be robust and uh, relevant. And now, right now, we are in this, this stabilization phase, this much needed stabilization phase uh, at the moment. But of course, that doesn't mean that we are not going to continue to invest in new technology and innovation. Um, but just one thing, this current race to the bottom really has to stop because it's detrimental to progress. Um, so the only framework to summarize um, in which this just transition can happen and we can also achieve tripling renewables, in my point of view, is one where all players in the supply chain um, can intervene on a level playing field. So long question, <laughs> but it's difficult really to, to say which one market it is. 
Thank you. Um, mm. Lars, I'll go to you. I mean, Mazda is an interesting company. I mean, you've invested long term in offshore wind in, in mature markets and actually pretty early investor in some of those uh, big first running offshore wind projects, for instance, in the UK. But you've also invested quite heavily in Africa on onshore and other places in the, in your, in the Middle East as well. What's the, what's the real focus? Because you've, you've got huge growth ambitions. What's, what's the real focus for the next five, ten years? Uh, yes, so the, the focus cannot be on, on uh, single markets. <clears throat> we have this target of 100 gigawatt of uh, secured uh, renewables until 2030. So this cannot be done by one or two markets. So it's, it's a combination of mature markets. Um, if, if you take offshore, um, you've seen that the UK and Germany is one of our core markets. We, we will um, have an eye on the US and APEC as, as all global players for offshore wind. But you mentioned also other technologies, uh, and if you take PV in the, in the Middle East, in Africa, um, and uh, then we just recently bought uh, or, or invested into wind onshore in, in the US heavily. So it's, it's, it's a bright, quite broad portfolio that we are aiming at to, to, to get this target of 100 gigawatt until 2030. But of course, I mean, you see in, in recent years um, some markets, and they were mentioned before, where everybody has an eye on. I think it will be crucial on the one hand that the industry gets gets rid of the supply chain bottlenecks and, and challenges that we have on the one hand, but then on the other hand, you need to have stable governance support to make markets attractive. And I think this is sometimes underestimated by some, some regulators and governments um, because capital is shy. There's a lot of capital available, but um, people need to have the trust into investing into those long-term projects. Thanks, Lars. Um, uh, Wukai, I'm going to go to you. I mean, you're in a, in a very privileged position in that China, as we heard, um, you, you know, your own home market was over 60% of global installations last year. That's propelled you also into the position of being number one uh, turbine manufacturer, um, according to you know, BNF and other uh, uh, figures. Um, wh where else are you focusing on and what's the kind of attractiveness uh, for you to go outside when your home market is so big and, and vibrant at the moment? Yeah, I think actually, uh, first of all, I would like to see many thanks to actually the, the, the very clear the, the strategy from the Chinese government talking about the, the zero, zero carbon, especially in the past 30 years, actually by, by the law, by the industry, actually, we can gradually ramp up the, the understanding the technology, but also the curve with uh, very comprehensive uh, supply chain capability, but for sure, the, uh, if we see the, the from b either a business point of view or another, even talking about the climate change point of view, we can we, we do believe we can contribute more to the human being to the to the world. Actually, if talking about the global business, uh, frankly, we we have to be very clear understanding the unique of our industry, wind industry, basically uncertainty, as I always mentioned, uncertainty is the only certainty for our business, because we have to consider the different, uh, the, the, the wind, wind condition, uh, constructions uh, uh, limitation, talking about the different uh, the product based, uh, uh, the structure, financial structure, and also talking about the different uh, environment, and also for sure very important talking about the, the uh, the great issues. So, or frankly, from government point of view, we are not uh, rush. Just to be want to be step by step. So now it's very focused on the, the market like uh, Brazil, uh, Chile, and all very focused on the the, the market here, uh, Middle East. Actually, one one very special I would like to to mention uh, the market here, Middle East, because basically we have strong believe in green hydrogen. So basically, our footprint for the green hydrogen came back to 2009 in China. We already uh, put the activities, and also we have the first uh, green hydrogen product in China, uh, 2013. And also, we we talking about this one. If we see the world, the the, the future, and also we we talking about the the uh, gradually from the generation side into the consumer side like a uh, green methanol, uh, step by step. So basically, based on such kind of uh, uh, consideration, we, we were focused on the, 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 the major market, including the Australia, and also for, for sure talking about uh, some uh, major market in Southeast Asia, like Thailand, like Yunnan, that's all. 
So we would like to really uh, step by step to run, run up or on better understanding and uh, we'll, uh, cope together corresponding the specified uh, uh, technical solution. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I got a few takeaways there. So green hydrogen is an element uh, which I think is important to introduce. Um, and then you've you also um, you've talked uh, quite a lot around uh, the Middle East region, which I think you know, we, we've, we've flagged as well. Um, Southeast Asia um, as well um, as, as kind of key growth areas. Um, Girish, I, I want to turn to you. I mean, Sislon was set up as the first kind of global south, global wind turbine manufacturer um, by, by the great uh, Saucy Tanti um, and established itself around the world. Um, we're now seeing India um, accelerating um, and actually starting to reach its potential again after a, a few difficult years, I think. Um, what, can, what can we do to get growth going <coughs> outside of the big five markets? What can we do to make sure the growth is spreading to the global south markets? I mean, as we've heard from Fong and Joyce, we've got essentially um, China, the US, Germany, um, Brazil and India, um, and then a few others. You know, how do we get growth going across, across the global south? Thank you. I think, uh, you know, over the past uh, decades, I mean, one thing we've learned is there are basic few fundamentals to be in place for growth to come in any country in the renewable space. I think first, as Lars mentioned, I think having that stable outlook from any country in terms of their vision and clarity and a long-term policy regulatory environment to facilitate giving that, you know, 10, 15 years outlook with certainty is the first step, I think. And the countries in Global South which are putting that roadmap in place, I think will attract the growth. So that's the first, you know, whether the governments have made up their mind, do, it, do they really want to go for renewables and how do they want to do it? So I think that's the first step. I think the step, second step then comes where, you know, when they are able to uh, garner strength from the combination of South-South and North-South collaboration in terms of technology, manufacturing, uh, attracting the finances, uh, which then allows the ecosystem to develop in a country. And then, you know, you get the momentum happening. So. And as I mentioned, you know, there are some tough calls that countries have to make in terms of the transition. So I think uh, largely it's, you know, getting that vision, action plan in place and putting all the uh, necessary uh, ecosystems in place to initiate the growth, I think. So I think countries which have done that, you know, India did in the early days, China then took on very big way in the global south. Several new other uh, uh, global south countries are, we are seeing in Middle East, several of them now doing it. Southeast Asia is also setting out. So I think countries which are giving that clear visibility because for a whole energy transition to happen, unless you don't have a long-term plan, which is, you know, and of course for that you need a stable government also. So unless you don't have that combination of things, uh, it's very difficult and the flip-flop happens actually. We've seen that in matured markets also. I mean, in the US, if you see, uh, you know, with change in red to blue, blue to red, uh, we've seen markets kind of switching on, switching off. And that has not really taken the true potential of wind even in US. It's only now when we have a stable outlook with clarity of policy that even in matured markets we are seeing that sharp rise. And I think China is a great example where they made it a mandate, they had that clear focus and I think that's the reason they were able to get to that scale. I think other countries can replicate that success also. Yeah, thanks Girish. I'll, I'll go back to you, um, Anna. Um, I mean, you, you mentioned in your intervention um, the market signals <coughs> which are given out for, for wind. I mean, we've had <clears throat> several years where manufacturers have struggled uh, because of uh, you know, low EBIT margins. Um, prices have gone on a, on a kind of downward trajectory through tender systems and that's challenged people's profitability and I think that's happened 
across the world at different times and it's still happening in, in different markets. Um, so, I mean, my question to you, and I don't want to put you on the spot, is, I mean, what are the kind of obvious solutions for giving a stronger market signal for wind renewables? And also, I mean, where are the places where um, you think things are working from a policy point of view at the moment? It's a um, very good question. I think um, a lot of things need to happen so that we are long-term uh, profitable. Um, but uh, all of the wind turbine manufacturers are working on these strategies right now also because it's about global cooperation or global also um, interdependence. Um, so for us right now, one of our key priorities is, um, you know, that uh, volume visibility and predictability are further improved because this will mitigate speculation on also the race to the bottom that I mentioned earlier. And also for us, it's important that governments commit to really specific volumes, like those we have seen, for example, in the EU wind charter. So tangible numbers are important so that we get more growth going, as you said. In a similar vein, uh, we have seen some progress with permitting processes. Um, in, in some areas not, as you mentioned, Ben, in your introduction, some permitting processes are actually slower than before. But again, I think there's lots of room improvement there. Um, and the biggest need uh, I'd like to highlight is the need to transform, you know, those really ambitious targets into real projects and profitability for all of us, not just certain uh, parts of the value chain. And uh, we need governments and communities to take the value of wind very seriously. And this needs to be reflected in public procurement procedures and also auctions, as proposed, for example, by the EU uh, Net Zero Industry Act. And these public procurement processes uh, need to be built on clear, transparent, and well-harmonized uh, criteria that should go beyond just price uh, considerations. For example, such as cybersecurity, also biodiversity, or other supply chain investments. Price so, criteria, an urgent matter. And then, as we all talked about, we need a resilient supply chain. And that means also implementing further measures to ensure there's uh, fair competition in the environment internationally. Uh, and if you may allow me one more thing, in all of these aspects also to mention is uh, public funding is essential, specifically you're working for funding instruments for clean tech so that we can scale up uh, manufacturing capacity and also related infrastructure like ports and vessels for offshore. And if we are going to help countries reach their very ambitious targets today, this really requires an economically robust wind industry in Europe as well. But as you all know, the industry still faces major challenges such as uh, cost pressures and price competition, auctions, high steel prices, high inflation, and so on. So after all, it really all revolves around removing those financial burdens for the event industry, and there's an especially urgent need for inflation adjustments uh, mechanisms, as well as putting a stop to negative bidding. I think that's also a very important one. And just to finalize, um, I think there are many points to touch on here, um, but I believe, to come back to your question, that with standardization and appropriate planning, um, we can really make sure that the event industry is robust and profitable, also in the long term. Mm. Great, thank you. There's a, there's a lot of food for thought there. Um, I'm going to go to you, Lars, and we're going to start wrapping up soon. But I mean, I'm curious as as somebody who's on the other side of this, who's you know essentially got huge amounts of capital to invest, has got an enormous pipeline, and you want to get to 100 gigawatts, you know, of of, of capacity um, in in the relatively short term. When you when you look at the supply chain for wind, I mean, first of all, does it fill you with confidence, you know, in terms of getting to where you'd like it to be? And are you confident about getting the turbines that you need at the price that you need to make projects work? So I think that, that's, that's the first question. And secondly, I mean, what do you think that the buyers and the developers can do to help uh, make, you know, create a, a healthy supply chain? I mean, in the past, I think long ago in the ancient history of the wind industry, some of the big utilities did long-term framework agreements, for instance, which really helped the companies like Siemens, investors in the early days to, to scale up. I mean, how do, how do you think about it? Yeah, but valid question. Um, am I confident? Yes. Uh, I think the last two years, two, three years were a tough one for wind offshore. Uh, but I mean, which industry hasn't faced tough times? So I think this goes in waves and, and uh, but the 
the path is clear, the target is clear, and there are ways to overcome it. And I think we, we had a dip in terms of the supply chain costs and the bottlenecks of uh, availability, but it's, um, it's, it's improving and I think lays the path for significant growth that is ahead. So I'm confident there's, there are a lot of topics that need to be solved, and I mentioned a lot of them. Um, when it comes to what, what can developers do, and the industry, uh, both, I mean, developers and, and suppliers is, among a lot of things, I think this speed of development and inventing new, new turbines and growing uh, with a fast speed was some kind of success to get things profitable and investments over the hurdle rates. But it came at a price because the industry and the supply chain didn't have the time to standardize and to work on cost reduction. And I think it's time now to, to reduce the speed of getting bigger turbines and more, more, more capacity and more megawatt per turbine. And, and saying, okay, let's, let's standardize more, let's slow the speed, let's get the, the, this, uh, the, 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 the supply chain, the, uh, all the turbine developers, uh, the, the, the manufacturers, get them a little bit of time to, to work on the cost reduction. And as you said, long-term agreements are a way to, to build alliances on this one. And I think this will help a lot in, in overcoming the challenges that we had in the recent years. Uh, thanks, Lars. Um, very insightful comments. Let's come back to you on one. You mentioned right at the end cost reduction. Are we still on a cost reduction curve as an industry? It's, it's a journey, I would say. Um, and if you, if, you, if you look back on the, on the last year, those big projects that went through the press where the, the developers needed the pull plug, what happened? Um, over the last couple of years, it was so important to secure the offtake, the income, to fix the, the top line, and then later on um, to, to do the supply chain and, and buy the, the, the turbines and get those contracts. Why did this happen? Because it was always costs were always going down. But then what happened is some developers locked in their, their top line, the PPA, CFDs, whatever, um, and then costs exploded in contrast to the past. Um, I think this was a big learning for the whole industry. Um, and, and as Anna said, we need to work with how, how do we cope with inflation, how do we synchronize fixing income and as well as the, the, the cost side. Um, and comparably, it's, it's bringing about profitability. In the end, it's not about having the, I mean, if we have inflation like over the last years, cost reaction nominal, but in terms of developing in, in, in getting the profitability and, uh, of, of investments in, in large infrastructure projects like wind offshore to get this up, we need to have the, the best combination of high income and reduced cost, and that's it. And, and this is where the industry got a tough hit over the last two years, but I'm pretty confident that we'll get over it. Uh, thanks, Lars. And I think that's provided um, us at GWET with some good um, messaging lines as well on how to explain this current situation that we're in as an industry. I'm going to turn to Wu Kai now, um, maybe for the last, you know, last uh, intervention. Um, uh, and I'll, I'll give everyone just a couple of words just to, to wrap up. Um, so in China, I mean, you, you have huge volume, huge scale. You're, uh, in manufacturing terms, uh, you know, uh, building wind turbines in an incredibly um, efficient way. Um, you're competing essentially against the regulated coal price and in a, an environment where prices have gone down in the energy market <coughs> very significantly. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, and for, for many years, you know, that, you know, kind of very um, it, you know, vital competition in China uh, seemed to be, you know, working. It's created huge scale. Um, but now the Chinese industry is challenged as well with these very low prices, race to the bottom. You also have this phenomenon that um, Lars mentioned of bigger and bigger turbines, uh, maybe with shorter product cycles. So how, do, how does Goldwind, as the biggest manufacturer, you know, look at this situation of, of you know, making money and being able to scale up at the same time in this environment? Yeah, uh, I would like to, to highlight, actually, I just want to be uh, to share my personal view as uh, one engineer. 
So uh, basically, I don't see, uh, uh, from t technically, I, I, I do believe there's a, for whatever the industry, there's always some uh, physical uh, bottom line. So uh, basically, uh, to, to really consider all the, the technology, for example, if we back to the turbine technology, for example, if we're talking about uh, generally uh, divided the industry into the high wind speed or low wind speed, for sure, will based on the current theory, uh, uh, for the high wind speed, uh, prefer to have a bigger uh, nominal capacity com uh, compare uh, plus together with a little bit of smaller rotor diameter, or the low wind speed actually the much longer. Uh, bigger rotor diameters, but a re relatively smaller capacity. So uh, lead to the very traditional, uh, actually electrical engineer, uh, electronic engineer, automation technology, and also the, the blade uh, raw material, etc. So <clears throat> the second one, if we're talking about the, the, the current issues, so actually why more and more turbine manufacturers are actually driven for the bigger turbines? But if we see the history, basically Chinese market, uh, all, all the major turbine player in China uh, talking about the bigger rotor diameter, but a relatively smaller uh, no meter capacity. The reason is Chinese market is low wind speed. But all the major player from Europe, basically talking about historically, talking about the bigger turbines, but the relatively smaller the rotor diameters. The reason is the average wind speed is much higher than China. Even nowadays, it can really up to 7.5 meter per second. And also, basically, and lead to the different structure for, especially talking about the relative the cost for the, 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 the land. Because in China, basically, principally, we buy the land. We have the right to use it, but we don't own the land. But in the world, actually, most market, actually, the land is private. And so, and then lead to the, the very big difference on the, the land the pricing issues. So this one is the, the for sure. But for sure, there's also some uh, policy from the government to, for the industry. It's a, just why it's the issues. So if we put the, uh, we, we, without consider any uh, technical maturity of, of the, uh, the issues, but just to put all the major factors into the financial the analysis, so we can simply see the bigger turbine, they have a much better capex, talking about the BOP, talking about the, the uh, OPEX operation cost. So this one is the issues. And uh, the third one I would like to highlight actually the uh, back to the engineer. Uh, it's not always uh, the, the, the bigger, uh, as bigger as good be. The reason is actually we sh if we're talking about this one pr from product point of view, we should ask first ourselves how good we know technically. For, 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 for if we're talking about uh, the generators, I think it's in another world. This uh, industry, uh, like uh, electrical engineer for the generators, actually come back to 80 centuries. So basically, from uh, magnetic analysis, from design, is very, uh, very material. And then lead to the, the major challenge is for the, is for the uh, uh, manufacturing. For the uh, for PMD technology or for the traditional double feed, actually the major challenge from uh, uh, the grinding machine. But if ta talking about the blade, it's uh, different. For, for, for the more actually uh, traditional, the rotor diameter uh, cover from uh, 70 meters and graded to 120 meters, 140 meters, and 165 meters, and also 190 plus uh, meters, or even 200. And then come to the one question. Uh, the, uh, um, on balance or the, the, the dynamic uh, pro, uh, profile or performance from aerodynamic. So this one is the issues. I think actually the current issues, more and more engineer, they just to be brief, without really comprehensive, deep understanding. But parallelly, I have to see from another role, my, myself as management, and also we should really ask ourselves, do we really have the, we are the people leading the team. We are the lead people to, to support the industry. We are the people to really work here, sit down here, to so talking about what's the healthy ecosystem. So we should ask also ourselves in the past several years, what we, we are looking for. We, we have our mistake. So this one is the issues. We should really 
keep on very material due diligence, the practice, actually, I think actually back to 30 years before, is de developed by the European Union. I, up to now, myself at least, I still think it's the most important and the fundamental, very healthy and very systematic the, the, the system to support the industry. And then we can have the balance point. One side, uh, we, have, we can really drive as, uh, as better could be for the industry, for the, 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 the wind industry, for the carbon emission. But on another side, uh, we don't really influence too much on the innovation. Oh, innovation always very, very positive, but always plus together parallelly with, with the risk. Yeah, thanks, Wukai. Um, I mean, I, I understand your focus on engineering quality. Totally get that, especially knowing your, your history in these, in these areas. Um, but just quick, one quick question just to, to finish. I mean, do you, does China now slow down this kind of race to the top in terms of turbine size? Is that slowing down now? And also, can, we, can, we still make, can you make money as an industry in these, in these conditions? First of all, most Chinese company for such kind of chain Losing money, it's very clear. If you see the the auto listed company, very clear, the balance sheet or the the uh, the profitability from the re report. Second one, especially recent couple of years, more and more the the, the company and the utility they are aware of such kind of uh, the potential the uh, the the risk. Third one, very clear. There's a still some Chinese company. They still be very brief. Doesn't matter. I think actually the world is open. Uh, everybody can really select what, what kind of road they want to, to, to go. <laughs> but uh, myself, I want myself 100% trust in the future at the most the two, two years. Everybody will be scared. Everybody will be aware. And everybody will back to the, the right way. Okay, so optimistic and maybe a, you know, a, a consolidation of best practices in, in China around you know, quality and, and focusing on, on the manufacturing. Fair enough. Right, we're going to finish now, but I'm going to give everyone just two words each. I mean, what, what would you like all of you to see most of all over these next few years so that we can meet these huge targets? And I'll, I'll, I'll start with you, Lars. Oh, oh thanks. Um, two things. Uh, one is... Um, uh, a coordination and, and cooperation between developers and suppliers to, to overcome the, the profitability challenges. And second is uh, governments that understand that they need to attract investors by giving attractive and stable environment. Girish. Yeah, I think somewhat I resonate with what he's saying is I think um, the success, I, if I was to put it the other way around, you know, the only thing that is going to keep us away from our 3x target uh, as a, as a industry as countries is primarily two elements one is lack of collaboration or partnerships uh, and this is across various elements you know and second is uh, governments not being able to provide a stable long term outlook for the industry to grow i think these are two fundamental elements uh, which could keep us away Thank you, Girish. And Anna, I'll give you the last word here. Yeah, I, um, I would agree with Girish that the visibility and predictability would help us a lot. And um, as you also all mentioned, uh, more collaboration on topics that um, are relevant for the entire value chain because innovation and resilience is not just something that OEMs work on. It's something we need to work together with customers and, and political stakeholders. Thank you very much. Listen, I think um, that, was, that was a really insightful uh, panel. We've barely scratched the surface, as ever. Um, I'd urge everyone to get a copy of the report, have a look at it, engage with us. We're organizing a number of forums uh, with, with uh, wind energy companies, with manufacturers, with stakeholders around the report. So please stay in touch. I can see my colleagues from uh, GRA uh, uh, here maybe trying to move us off this panel, but we would like to take a family photo uh, before we end, if that's okay. Thank you. <laughs>